waiting in a couple more minutes. We're waiting to make sure that we get everybody on. Uh, we do have someone actively muting folks as they come on, but go ahead and uh, go ahead and go ahead and mute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be right back in about two minutes. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the managed care data quality monitoring webinar. This is an ongoing monthly data series. We do post these uh, webinars for use training and also in staff information. Uh, this one is going to have a focus of the behavioral health short Doyle information. Um, and data that comes into DHCS. And um, my name is Amy Peterson. I am the Managed Care Data Support Section Chief here in the Program Data Reporting Division, which is part of um, Enterprise Data Information Management Organization within DHCS. Uh, it's quite a mouthful. We call it EDEM. Uh, next slide. I'd like to introduce you to some of the folks here at DHCS who um, both participate as uh, subject matter experts, as well as support um, DHCS staff and information going out to all of you. Uh, you may be new to this series if you're behavioral health and coming and looking at from the county perspective. Um, again, I'm Amy Peterson, a manager here in EDEM. Um, with me is going to be Sarah Vera, who will be speaking on managed, health, managed care health plans. Um, and DMC ODS uh, behavioral health 274 or provider data. Uh, we're going to have Tony Wen, who's going to be speaking about the McPar data and grievances and appeals. Um, Carla. I think we just lost sound, didn't we? Somehow I got muted. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm sorry, Carla Porta. Porter with uh, behavioral health, and she will be speaking about network adequacy. Uh, Eliezer Munoz, who will be speaking about short Doyle um, submission standards, data submission standards. Um, we call him Ellie here. And then Jeff Jennings is our subject matter expert here in EDEM, really, and he will be speaking specifically to accessing DHCS Data Documentation Center. Um, information and companion guides that will you, you'll find very helpful in navigating our data here at DHCS. Uh, in support of this pro project is Atif Habib, who um, both puts together this uh, data um, project, the actual web uh, page and slides, and he also uh, reaches out to all of the different subject matter experts to uh, get this process started every month. Samantha Van is uh, our our invitee master um, and she helps run our listserv as well as helps run our uh, web web um, hosted webinar series and Abby Geber Selassie is now um, today driving the the web 
with the webinar itself and, and doing the slideshow. May, is, we have three people. Atif is actually um, monitoring chat. May, Sean Eng, and Su Jung Kim are all uh, watching the chat, and we will be collecting um, all of your questions and trying to either answer them at the end of this program or within our frequently asked questions page that we post online at our webinar page. And then uh, finally, Brianna Saley, who actually posts everything. She is our handy dandy webmaster. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So for general questions, please submit your question to the WebEx Q&A message box. Uh, that will get to us and we will be able to answer it. Go ahead and ensure that your questions are visible to the participants in the chat. Um, and then that way you don't send a private chat to us. We might miss that one. Uh, for specific questions, you can go ahead and reach out to your data mailbox and we'll instruct you how to do that at the end of the slideshow. Our agenda today is going to be, again, the data quality monitoring standards and objectives, behavioral health data submission requirements, short Doyle process and submission standards, and the DHCS Documentation Center. I will also cover some communication and some next steps. Um, go ahead and make sure that you mute yourselves. Make sure that your speakers are turned up or your headphones are on, uh, and we will begin. Uh, First up, we're going to talk a little bit about cart dimensions. This is a really common uh, process here at DHCS. Uh, we are looking for completeness, accuracy, reasonability, and timeliness of this data. So is it coming in on time? Did you meet your due date first off? Uh, is it reasonable? Are we expecting what you're sending in? Um, is it going to have accuracy? Like, are there typos or problematic records that are coming in? Does it have the right number of characters in uh, the SIN or the NPI or whatever the record is um, entailing? And then completeness, it's checking for any surplus or duplicate data. All of these things can trigger a rejection of the data that comes into the DHCS PACES project or PACES um, uh, System and then that system will let you know if you are needing to resubmit. Next. So, again, looking at timeliness, especially of the 274 file that um, Sarah Rivera will be covering today, and that's the one that really pertains uh, currently to CART dimensions, as far as I can. I can say from the Eden perspective. So those measures related to the reasonability, completeness, and accuracy of the provider data. So each check has an identifier in the format um, where the XXX is uh, representative of a three-digit number. And the first digit of that number reflects what type of a calculation and determines the score on whether or not um, it's getting rejected. Next. So, coming up next, we're going to be talking about behavioral health, MHP, and DMC ODS data submission requirements. Next slide. And we're going to be going over the overall behavioral health data submission requirements and information related to that behavioral health 274 um, for both MHP and DMC ODS. Uh, if you have um, some specific questions about DMC ODS. There is uh, an entire webinar dedicated to DMC ODS that was done prior, and it is listed in our uh, webinar uh, web page. It's not right in front of me right now. I can't remember exactly which month we did it, but it was in 2023 data. So the Behavioral Health Managed Care Program Annual Data Report, the MCPAR, uh, the Behavioral Health 1915 Quarterly Appeals and Grievances Report, and the Behavioral Health Network Adequacy Information. And we'll be discussing Behavioral Health Short Doyle data in quite a bit of detail uh, when we get to our topic two. Uh, next slide. So to introduce you to Behavioral Health Provider Data will be um, our friend and colleague, Sarah Rivera, and she is the 274 Behavioral Health Project Manager. Uh, Sarah, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, take it away. Amy. All right, go ahead and go to the next slide. 
So we've had a lot of activity going on with both the MHP and the DMC ODS 274 um, expansion project. Um, if, as a reminder on this first bullet of it for um, all counties, MHP and DMC ODS plans that are in production for the 274, um, it is required that you submit your files for the previous reporting month uh, between the 1st and the 10th of each month, no later than midnight on the 10th of the month in which you're submitting your file for the previous month. Otherwise, it'll be flagged as late and over time, this could be a potential um, area for a corrective action plan. Um, so that's that's the number one reminder is make, make sure for the counties that are in production that you are submitting the file no later than the 10th. We always tell, we, we're, we're still having monthly work groups for the MHPs and DNC ODS plans that are very specific to what you need to do and any upcoming changes. But one of the things that we always remind the, the plans is start, submit your files early in this range, you know, start it on the first, because if you, if there are errors in the file that you need to correct and resubmit, you want to know what those errors are early on, um, because we're looking at the file, the timeliness is based on when the file was accepted, was successfully processed by DHCS. We're not looking at the first time you submit and there were errors. So please start that submission early on so that you're not deemed if you need an extra day or two to correct and resubmit a file. Um, on the second bullet, plans must confirm via the validation response file that the file was successfully processed. So this is an area that we have found with some of the counties where they they let us know via email, we submitted our file on time, everything's great. And then when we're running our quality checks, we don't see a file out there. So when we go back and look at the, the VRF, it'll, it says rejected. And so, if, so if, you're, if the county, if you're not looking at the file status for your file submission, and if it doesn't say accepted, then we we can't we have no record that that file was um, successfully processed. So that's just a reminder: double check the validation response file um, before you assume that the file was successfully processed. On the third bullet for the PDSRF. Um, this is the production data submission reconciliation form. This is um, still a very important requirement. At some point, we may convert this to JSON, um, but we look at this every month. There's a couple of things that we look at. We look at the contact information, um, make sure that's always current because when we run the quality checks, we send those quality checks to the contact that was identified in the PDSRF. Um, we ask that it's sent no later than the 15th um, of the month. Um, ideally, you should send it as soon as you see that your file is accepted. Um, and, uh, and then make sure you're completing it correctly because, again, in that PDSRF, you're, we're, you're asked to put in the actual file name uh, that you submitted for that month, and that's what we use. We do literally compare that file file name to what we see out in the system, and then that's what's used for our quality checks. So very important that the PDSRF is submitted on time no later than the 15th of each month. Um, so this for, on this slide, monthly data quality checks are in, develop, uh, in development to report data issues to plans. So for the MHPs, we've already started, we did a, a beta, um, we, we did a beta test in December for five counties on the quality checks that we'll be running every month. This is what we're, we're calling this our phase one quality checks because there may be some changes to that. So we did a beta test on, in December. And then this month um, on February 22nd, we, we released our first full set of data quality checks for the MHPs for their December reporting period, and that went out to all the counties. So this will be the first time that all the counties see what these monthly quality check reports look like, the actions that they're required to take, 
and the, the timelines that they need to either correct the data or notify the department that they that uh, either they're in agreement or disagreement with, with the results of the data quality checks. So, so we just started that process this month for the mental health plans. Uh, the second bullet, MHPs are submitting 274 files for their provider network. Um, this is just a reminder to both the DNC, uh, the MHPs and the DNC ODS plans of the BHA, BHINs that are authorizing this work and the timelines. Uh, so within each of those BHA, BHINs, it, it reiterates what we're saying about the requirement to submit on time and, um, um, and, and when they were expected to start. For the DNC ODS plans, we're, um, the, the plans are, uh, per the BHIN, uh, the plans are required to be in production by March um, of this year. So we're reaching out now to the DNC ODS plans to see where they're at in this process, which plans are actually gonna be able to meet this timeline. Um, and, and we'll be requesting bi-weekly status reports. So, and for those DNC ODS plans that are in production, um, we, we will be, we will start working on that automated monthly quality check as well. That hasn't actually happened yet, but that will start happening. We're beginning the requirements and that'll be rolling in over the next few months. And this final bullet is just kind of a reminder that we're beginning to, to do requirements gathering for the Calling Behavioral Health Administrative Integration Program that's expected to start in early 2025. So we're looking into how this will, um, uh, how will the companion guide um, be modified to reflect this new contracting type? And that's it. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, next step to discuss behavioral health network adequacy is Carla Porter, our network adequacy and oversight section chief here at DHCS. Welcome, Carla. Um, I believe that you are on. I am, thank you, Amy. Um, good morning. As Amy stated, my name is Carla Porter and I am one of the section chiefs in the network adequacy and oversight section. So for behavioral health network adequacy, for our data reporting for the 274, um, we use the annual network adequacy certification data to look at capacity and composition to ensure you have an adequate network um, to serve your Medi-Cal member. Hey, Carla, I think we're having a slight, had a slight network. We just had a slight network glitch. Could you go back to the 274 first bullet? Yes, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, I don't think it was you, it just froze. That's oh, all. Okay. <laughs> well, was just go back and unfreeze. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll go back. So for network adequacy, our business rules as it relates to the 274, we look at, we will be looking at our annual certification for network adequacy. The data that we'll be looking at is the capacity and composition data, which ensures that you have the behavioral health plans have an adequate um, network, as well as time and distance. We use the uh, geomapping methodology to determine that you're meeting the time and distance standards. The 274 currently is being only used for the MHPs, um, as Sarah mentioned earlier. We do have other data requirements that we require that are outside of the 274 requirement, which is the timely access data tool, which measures um, timely access. So we have a separate tool that we use to monitor uh, that requirement. In terms of our timelines for network adequacy for the MHPs, um, for the next submission period, we will be looking at the monthly submissions um, as we'll be on to the 274 platform. On the DMC ODS side, we will still be using the network adequacy certification tool and the reporting on the network adequacy certification tool is still a point in time uh, dating reporting requirement. And I'll pass it over to Tony. 
Thank you so much, so much, Carla. And yes, to introduce Tony Wen, he is our County Provider Oversight and Operations Support Section Chief. He'll be speaking to us today about the appeals and grievance reports as well as the MCPAR. Take it away, Tony. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Carla. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Tony Wen, and I'm the Section Chief in the County Provider Oversight and Operations Support Section, and that's under the Medi-Cal Behavior Health Oversight and Monitoring Division. So a lot of uh, terminology to name, so I won't uh, bore everyone with uh, acronyms. Um, so as Amy stated for today's presentation, I will be I will be providing information regarding submission requirements for both the Managed Care Program Annual Report, MIPAR, and the quarterly appeals and grievance reports for special mental health services, as well as DMC uh, ODS. <clears throat> for MCPAR, this is an annual report for MHP and DMC ODS counties to, to submit to DHCS regarding appeals and grievances reporting indicators as outlined in BHIN 22-036. Um, just a reminder, the reporting period does cover the state fiscal year from July 1st to June 30th. Um, so, as a reporting and int submission instruction, following the end of each reporting period, um, MHP and DMC ODS County shall submit the completed MCPAR reports uh, for each delivery system to DHCS by the first business day of September. Um, all submissions are to be submitted as specified in the BHIN, unless specified otherwise by DHCS through communications. Um, to date, uh, we have submitted the, our second MCPAR submission to CMS, and that was completed on December of 2023. Uh, we do appreciate all the county support and assistance in ensuring that this reporting requirement is being met. Uh, we do continue to work with CMS as well as our internal partners to look at opportunities to refine and streamline the process. Uh, we do understand that these uh, annual reporting requirements are you know, a heavy lift for the county, so we do want to acknowledge the amount of work that goes into it. Um, so we do have ongoing communication with our internal partners as well as CMS to look at opportunities to streamline the process as to look at ways to refine the process as well to uh, reduce any administrative burden for our uh, county partners. And just to remind everyone that for a question regarding uh, behavior health MCPAR, uh, please do submit your question to the county support inbox at county support at DACS. That's having another go. little glitch and Tony is frozen. Uh, Tony, you're unfrozen now. Can you go back to what you were just saying about additional information? And uh, I think you were going to cover some of the questions that where people can send questions. Yeah, you know, thank you, Amy, for flagging that for me. Do let me know if I do freeze or if my audio gets a little glitchy, and I'll definitely wouldn't mind starting over. You know, I will um, say the audio has been fine. Even when the image freezes, the audio is not disrupted, at least not for some of us. So. Perfect. Can I get a quick thumbs up if everyone was able to hear my presentation? All right, I, I see a couple of thumbs up, so that's perfect. No, thank you for that. Yep. Uh, okay, confirmation. we're getting a bunch. Yep, yep. yep. <laughs> okay, we're good. We're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but no, definitely it's, uh, you know, it's still a process for us to go through the MCPAR submissions, but again, no, we continue to look for opportunities to improve the process. Um, so if you do have any questions regarding MCPAR, please submit your question to county support at dhcs.ca.gov. Um, and if you could move on to the next slide, please, and I could go ahead and talk about the, uh, appeal, the quarterly appeals and grievance reports. So for the quarterly appeals and grievance reporting, this uh, reporting requirement is part of the 1915B waiver special term and condition 813 and 814, um, as this is outlined in BHN 23-062. Uh, please note that for fiscal year 23-24, this was the first time that DHCS began collecting these quarterly reports from MHP and DMC ODS uh, counties. And we do acknowledge that we have received feedback that, you know, the information that's being provided on the quarterly reports is uh, duplicative of the annual reports. Please note that these are two separate reporting requirements uh, set forth by uh, the department and CMS. Um, so, again, just like in any other process, we are always looking for opportunities to you know, find ways to streamline the process. Um, as we have heard from numerous counties that there is a lot of similarities uh, to the question, but there's a little bit of differences. And that's the discussion that we're having with internal leadership as well as CMS to see if there's a way for us to, you know, in a way, consolidate the information or just to combine it um, just to make it easier for the counties. Uh, but as of right now, it is two separate reporting requirements, one on an annual basis for MCPAR and with this um, quarterly reporting, it's on a quarterly basis. 
Um, so I just want to report out that today, you know, DACS has successfully submitted quarter one report to CMS. So again, thank you to all our county partners for uh, providing us with timely reporting data. Um, and we're currently in the process of submitting quarter two to meet the March 1st deadline to CMS. Um, so as I've mentioned to my team, these due dates does come up really quickly. Um, and we do understand that there are a lot of different uh, reporting requirements as well as obligations that the county has as well. So um, please note the, the time frame of these submissions as uh, for DCS, we do have a short turnaround uh, window as well to get the information reviewed and approved uh, internally as well as getting it over to CMS. Um, so again, uh, we, we're looking at ways to streamline the process to make it easier and more efficient for counties. Um, and definitely, you know, we'll, we'll have more dialogue on that if we, there are any updates to the process of submission. Um, so similar to McPar, uh, for MHP and DMC ODS counties, these are to be submitted uh, separately on separate reports for each delivery system. Um, and all submissions are to be submitted to DHCS as specified in the BHN, unless otherwise specified by DHCS. Um, and for 1915B, again, if you do have any questions regarding on the submission or just questions in general about this reporting requirements, please submit your question to county support at dacs.ca.gov. Um, and I didn't know if we were doing questions at the end, Amy, or if this is a good time for me to pause to take any questions from um, the audience today. I haven't been monitoring the chat, but there may be a few questions that you could hit right now. If you want to go through the chat really quickly to see what it um, uh, comes up for you. Uh, next yeah, up will be Ellie. So, um, yeah, if you can. No, take I'm not there. seeing any right now at the moment. Perfect. Great. So, um, Tony, at the end, if that comes up for you uh, and, and for Carla or for Sarah, we'll catch it and we'll read them back. Perfect. Thank you, Amy. And now we'll go ahead and monitor the, the uh, chat inbox in case and a question comes in. Perfectly. You you are absolutely free to go ahead and answer as they come up and we'll collect them for our frequently asked questions page. Sounds good. Thank you, Amy. Uh, next step is um, we'll be discussing short Doyle data submission standards. Um, and this is Ellie Munoz, who is our short Doyle, short Doyle Medi-Cal unit chief. Thank you. Ellie, welcome. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Eli Munoz, and I'm the manager in the Short of Medical Unit under the Local Governmental Financing Division. Um, I'll be providing a high-level overview of the Short of Data claims, and I'll be discussing the different uh, phases. I'll be discussing the submission phase, the processing, the adjudication, and the payments. I'll also be discussing about uh, more information on the DHC. DHCS application portal, which is a collection of web applications that allows counties and trading partners to access information securely over the internet. We'll also be discussing the short of Medi-Cal adjudication system, as well as the payment systems, which is our SMART and USL. Um, we'll also be discussing uh, regarding some of the edits in, in the various systems, uh, frequent submission mistakes, and just providing some short on Medi-Cal resources. I'm probably going to go off camera just to avoid uh, some glitches. For All right, so here, this is the short data flow. Um, so as you can see, the, the counties actually submit and upload their 837s, uh, 837P and 837Is to short oil. From there, short oil will send uh, adjudicate the, the, the claims. If they're denied, they'll send out an 835, send it back out to the provider. If the claims are approved, it goes to the various systems. It'll go to our payment system. And also, there goes a, a file to the PACE system, which is then sent to the warehouse. Um, but I'll be focusing more on the, the top portion uh, regarding the payment systems. Uh, it'll go to SEO, which is our state controller's office. What they'll do is they'll write a uh, check and then that check will be sent back to the short oil system, which will which will generate the 835 and send back to the counties. And also, as state controller's office will send the warrant to the to the counties back. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, we discussing the submission process. This is the DAC application portal. Uh, this is a login portal. 
So the portal is where the counties and trading partners upload the 837P and 837I transaction files. Um, <clears throat> they receive claim related communication back in HIPAA compliant format. Uh, there's also a move it function that allows the trading partners to upload and download the, their, their files into the county folders. There's also uh, ad effects uh, application. This is a, includes a library of pre-built standards such as XWELs, Edifacts, HIPAAs, and lots more. Uh, so an example is <clears throat> if you provide codes, uh, like for example, like diagnosis codes or NDCs, and they are no longer invalid, um, Edifacts will reject your file. So this is one of our validations that we use to make sure that all the codes are actually valid. And so now move on to the, the processing phase. So now we're going to talk about the transaction. Oh, sorry. Go back. The transaction sets that we use in, in the short level Medi-Cal system. Uh, we use the counties upload their 837P and 837I inpatients. So what an 837P is, is the healthcare claim professional, and those require HIPAA codes and CPT codes. The 837I is a healthcare claim inpatient transaction, and these require revenue codes. Uh, the TA-1, this is an acknowledgement report. Uh, this verifies that the envelope information and indicates that the 837P or 837I file was successfully received or rejected. The next one is the 999. This is a function acknowledgement. This confirms that the 837P or the 837I was received and it generates a response to transactions, whether the transactions are in compliance with HIPAA formatting requirements. And another one that we use is the SR report. This is not really a, a HIPAA transaction file, but it helps people like me. Uh, it helps decipher the 999. So it kind of gives uh, more of a guidance on where the, the error occurred, because I'm not really IT, so SR report is really useful. And the 835 is the last one. The remittance advises provides approval and denial information. Nice. Next, I'll be talking about the adjudication process. So here, um, I listed some of our rules and validation edits. So for one, uh, we have the Medi-Cal members eligibility. So we verify the Medi-Cal member using meds. Uh, the provider validation, we use the provider databases, PIMS and PRIMES, to verify that the providers are certified to provide the services. The next one we use is the NPI validation, and we use uh, NPES. And so here we, we use this validation for the rendering NPIs, and we're just checking the NPES database to verify that the NPI is active um, on the dates of service that the services were provided. And we also have lockout validations. Uh, this is just to prevent duplicate data, um, especially if there's already an approved service on that date. So uh, these are just some of the edits. Um, I did want to also, I included the, the current uh, procedural terminology codes. So on July 1st, 2023, uh, we transitioned to a different billing process to allow CPT codes. Um, CPT codes offer healthcare professions uh, uniform language of coding, um, uh, Medi-Cal service and procedures to streamline reporting and increase accuracy and efficiency. So we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the AMA, but the AMA uh, contains this types of information. So the CPT code set contained many codes with time basis for selection, uh, also which services a code encompasses and how to select a unit of a particular code and which providers can claim for a particular service. Um, and like I mentioned, the information here can be found in the AMA, which I'll mention when we talk about uh, reference materials. Uh, so after the adjudication process, uh, short door Medi-Cal will generate a claim summary file and that claim summary file contains approved and denied claims data and it also contains funding splits based on adjudication aid codes. Um, 
So the payment system will consume the claim summary file from the short loan Medi-Cal. Uh, we also uh, require a certified public expenditure, which is really the reimbursement form. Uh, this really just allows us to draw down the federal financial funds uh, for the claim for reimbursement. Uh, payment information is then sent to the accounting for processing. Uh, the accounting will schedule the payments and then send them over to the state controller's office. And then state controller's office uh, will process the file and, and generate a warrant. And then after that, it'll send the information back to the payment system, which is our Smart and USL. Um, Smart and USL then uh, create a, a claim payment file. And that claim payment file will then be sent to the short level Medi-Cal and they'll generate the 835 um, transaction file and then sends the 835 transaction file back to the DHC application portal for the counties to access. And here, these are just uh, some of the frequent submission mistakes uh, that will cause your claim to either be rejected or denied. So uh, the tr if the transactions are not compliant with HIPAA formatting requirements, uh, this will cause a rejection. As far as like timeliness, uh, claims that are submitted after 12 months of data service without a delay reason code will be denied. Uh, the the Medi-Cal the Medi-Cal member is not eligible uh, for the service based on their aid codes. Um, the provider NPI is not eligible to provide the build service. Uh, because they're not certified. And here I just mentioned some of the reference guides, um, the X12 implementation guide, uh, the American Medical Association, the MAA CPT codebook, and the companion guides, and they should all be used in conjunction with the billing manuals. And then here, here's, if you go and search through the MedCC library, here's where we have a lot of our reference uh, documentations. We have our billing manuals. Uh, we have um, our Carcan work. We have our Medi-Cal ACO chart. So this is where you can find all of our uh, mat reference materials that'll help you uh, successfully submit claims through the short of Medi-Cal system. And then I'll pass it over to Jeff Jennings. Thanks, Ellie. Great job. Really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I'll speak for a, a few minutes on the DHCS Documentation Center uh, and supply a little bit of information, uh, especially in light of what Ellie just shared about documentation. Uh, so uh, at the moment, the do DHCS Documentation Center uh, is mostly focused on managed care related uh, documents, companion guides, and other artifacts. Uh, the Behavioral Health Division has uh, been hosting documents on the BHIS uh, uh, platform through that's accessed through the DHCS portal, as I'm sure most of our county. Uh, County plan trading partners that are on this call are aware of, and that's where the short Doyle related documentation will remain for the foreseeable future. Uh, as I'm sure we're all aware, uh, the managed care uh, area and the behavioral health area have sort of operated separately over many years. We are now starting to integrate uh, further. Uh, it, there may come a point where the documentation shifts to the doc center, but uh, since nothing is broken, we're not going to fix it. As Ellie pointed out, anything related to short Doyle uh, uh, or to behavioral health can be found uh, on the uh, in the documentation areas that he uh, just went over. And I think probably what we'll do with the uh, behavioral health um, DMC ODS companion guide for the 274 is we'll, we'll post it in the same area that Ellie just went over and we'll post it on the documentation center. So it's available in both places. Um, and I think probably as time goes on, there may be more documentation and artifacts that are available in the doc center that are pertinent for county uh, staff. But at the moment, it's pretty much the uh, historically uh, available 
uh, areas in, in uh, BHIS that are where you're going to find the pertinent docs. Um, uh, yeah, next slide. So, um, as I kind of just reiterated, things are hosted separately. In fact, pretty much that's what I just said was the slide. Uh, if you do have any questions on any of it, please send an email to data exchange at dhcs.ca.gov uh, and we'll uh, help you get that sorted out. Uh, as one of the X12 uh, subject matter experts here at DHCS, I do work with Ellie's team and others in behavioral health regarding the companion guides for short Doyle and for the 274. So I'm happy to answer any questions or access issues that you might come up with uh, regarding that. Uh, next slide. And I think we're on to communication. So again, if you do have any questions about documentation, where it is, how to find it, et cetera, please contact the data exchange mailbox and we'll get you sorted out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff mm -hmm. and Ali. Thank you very much. Uh, we are getting some questions in the chat, but before we get to that, um, I'm going to go over the communication information. Uh, if I do interrupt anyone uh, related to glitches, I think it's because we're glitching here in our office and we're recording it. So it's catching yeah. the glitches. It, it, so I might stop and yeah. have you restart, but it's been I appreciate you guys from, all checking yeah. in. From what I was picking up, different people are getting up, but not everybody. So. Yeah, it was definitely in here. It stopped the recording. So, um, okay. yeah. Anyway, we're, once this is completed and it is recorded, we will be posting it um, up on our web with the slide deck itself. We will make sure that all of the links are live uh, when we do that. And then you may go ahead and use that to um, provide to your staff in kind. Uh, related to communication specifically for this particular webinar, um, the data group mailbox include the data documentation center. So we get those access requests and we hit approve and you should have access to the data exchange. Um, I'm not positive if all of the information that Ellie uh, was going over for that one web page uh, is in there, but we can make sure that, that there, there is either live links that will take you to that web page if you're in the data exchange, and um, we can work to get a data exchange request on that page as well. Um, the webinar uh, it, questions, comments, um, information that you want to see, you can go ahead and contact us at um, mcdss at dhcs.ca.gov. Again, live links. Uh, the Behavioral Health 274 expansion, that that box is here too, 274 expansion at dhcs.ca.gov. Uh, the Behavioral Health MCPAR will make that a live link, um, but that is a pretty heavy duty uh, email and it's MCBHOMD monitoring. So go ahead and make sure you have all of that spelled right, but that will go is a live link and you can just click on it. The BH1915B Appeals and Grievance Report, again, uh, we'll make sure that that county support um, link is, is live. BH Network Adequacy goes to NAOS, the Network Adequacy Services section. Uh, those folks will get your answers to you. And the Short Doyle Data Claims, that's the MEDCCC at dhcs.ca.gov. Again, once this is posted and you have access to the PDF of the slides, this will all be live linked. If that message is urgent, go ahead and notify your contact that it's urgent and put the urgent in the subject line and they'll get to it as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. Okay, we'll be going over some next steps, um, give you some ideas about whether or not you want to come to the next webinars or just watch them online. Um, the DHCS data collection status is pretty much all in production. We're in the testing phase for counties for the 274 drug Medi-Cal organized delivery systems. Um, once uh, that is out of the testing phase, we will be in full production. Next slide. 
Here's the resources for the data quality webinar series. This web page is hosted on the DHCS web page or website. Um, it's in the quality measures and reporting area. So you can go through some of the other quality um, information, but the series has its own separate page uh, and we do update it pretty regularly. And now you can also subscribe or unsubscribe directly to these webinars. Um, you can take yourself off if you no longer work on this project or, or, or that data submission, or you can send it to colleagues and have them subscribe themselves. Um, they will get updates, they will get invites, and they will get notified when uh, the webinar is, or the web page is updated and there's more information. Next slide. Here are some of the resources and the layout of the webinar series webpage. All of these will again be live links for you as well. Um, that resource page includes the dates and expected times and topics of the webinars as they come up throughout the year. Uh, the webinar series includes, again, a script of the page, the transcript, um, the slide deck itself with live links, the upcoming webinar schedule, the frequently asked questions that we get in the chat, which you are providing us with, um, and the answers we hunt down from subject matter experts if we can't answer them directly after the webinar. Uh, the frequently asked questions are really important. Uh, they help inform folks both at DHCS and within both the managed care plans and the mental health plans as well. Um, the glossary is <laughs> the glossary is really useful. Uh, there are several glossaries at DHCS. This one is specific to the webinars, and anything that we cover in an acronym format is um, hopefully uh, provided to you in the glossary with the definition or the spelled out um, initials. Next page. Okay, the upcoming webinar schedule. We have just completed the February 2024 on the be behavioral health short doyle information. Um, coming up, we're going to be talking about data templates and not everybody understands what the data templates are, but we are going to give you a good demonstration and we're going to talk about that. We are also discussing having um, some survey, survey participation and we might be either posting it during that webinar or providing you with a survey link to SurveyMonkey um, and getting some ideas uh, from you about what you'd like to see and, and what information is the most valuable. And then at the April 2024 annual address, uh, our deputy and and or our division chief will be talking to folks who are tuning in and listening or checking out the webinars online um, and uh, kind of addressing any concerns as well as going over some of the data checks. May 2024, the 274 Medi-Cal managed care provider data will be discussed again. Um, and we'll continue that uh, concept going forward to June 2024 with the 274 for mental health plans. Uh, every quarter, we're trying to get in a semi-annual data check, and so July will be one of the big ones. So next slide. Uh, we'll go over encounter data in August. September is 274 dental. October, again, monthly data checks, and we'll continue the series through with uh, the same kinds of um, topics. November will be the DMCODS for 274 provider data. December will cover MCPD PCPA provider data for the files and expansion. Um, give a lot of information related to those uh, newer data collection projects. And then January 2025, we'll again continue with semi-annual data checks. And these topics are subject to change uh, depending on whether or not we feel like we've covered the topic, but because things are still in flux a lot of the time, um, there might be information added. So we may expand the topics um, or we may uh, replace them with something that is urgent. And we will let you know through uh, our handy dandy subscribe or unsubscribe 
listserv that is posted on that webinar page. Um, we are collecting questions in the chat, and we do have some 274 questions and some short Doyle questions, and I can go back and read some of those. And I just wanna make sure that we have Sarah Rivera on, and looks like uh, maybe Tony, and then possibly, if, if we have all of our presenters available, that would be wonderful. So let's go back up. Let me see where I need to get to. And thank you everyone for using this chat and making your questions um, visible to everyone. Okay, it looks like one of the first questions is from Glenn. Uh, two, seven, four monthly quality check. If we have fixed the errors in the December reporting period and submitted the corrected file, will we get dinged again with the January reporting file? This may be specific to just your um, your submission, but if Sarah could speak to this in general, would you, would you get dinged? Yes. Um, so hi, this is Sarah. Hi, Glenn. Um, so yes. Yeah, so when so this is our first release of the monthly data quality checks for the MHPs. We started with December. Um, and every month from December forward, you'll you'll receive the same set of quality checks. So for the qual for the errors that were identified in December, yes, we expect you to fix those, resubmit the December file. Those same errors will potentially be in your January file. So and and we'll be running those data quality checks um, and sending to you probably around the mid March timeframe. Um, so if you know those errors are also in your January file, you should look into correcting those for January as well, or you can wait until we you, we send you the quality checks. But yes, it, if those same errors that you had, that that we sent you for December, um, if, if you expect if you um, if they're the same types of errors that would be in your January file, and you haven't corrected your January file, you will receive that set, the same set of. Um, errors. So hopefully that's that's clear. We have another question from Skylar uh, again about the 274 monthly quality checks. Uh, is there a way to send an email to DHCS with agree, disagree, um, and adjust fix the data moving forward for February instead of going back two months to December? So, um, so in the email that was sent out on the quality checks, we did include that if you have any questions about the quality checks, or if you disagree um, with the with the uh, with the errors, send us an email. Um, we ask for either the resubmitted file or any questions, concerns, disagreements by the 29th for uh, the December file. So yes, go ahead and send an email to us so that we can factor that in with your. Um, with your December data. And she followed that up with, can these checks moving forward be for the latest file submitted so that there's an easier way to do the fixed yep. submission for the counties? Yeah, so when, once we get caught up and we're in that monthly cycle, um, the intent is that, um, so for example, in March, um, when, when we're all caught up with the, the, with the previous files, then yes, every month when you submit your file for the previous month, you'll receive the quality checks. You'll have that window to correct and resubmit, hopefully within the same submission month. But the intent is uh, after we're all caught up with the previous months, every month you'll receive those quality checks for the previous month. It's just since this is the initial re release, we needed to go back a couple of months so that you have the opportunity to, to resubmit. Thank you so much, Sarah. It looks like we might have a question for uh, Ellie. Um, this one's from Richard Zhang. And the data gap issues with receiving short Doyle data, what are the plans for addressing that? Is Richard on the call? Can, I'm not sure, I'm not understanding the but question. Can we unmute him? If Richard's on the call, we're going to go ahead and unmute you, sir. Sorry, I'm just uh, passing along questions, so uh, I suppose I do not have more clarification. Okay. Well, if you if you pass along the email address to either MCDSS or Ellie's, uh, Ellie, I can't remember. Do the MedCC. Okay, MedCCC. Um, 
And those two email addresses will be live links in this webinar, and you can go ahead and send that along uh, with the full question. So it sounds uh, like it's not like a, there's no, it's not a um, consistent issue with amongst all plans then? What, because you asked for clarification, it sounds like it's a plan, it's specific. It's like a plan specific thing. I am not positive. I mean, I, I'm not yeah, the yep. short Doyle person. It would be Ellie and it's specific to gaps, Ellie. Yeah, I'm not understanding the gap. Yeah, so Richard, a little more information about what data gap means. Um, and in terms of receiving short Doyle data, short Doyle returns uh, an 835 transaction if the claim was, well, whether it was paid or not, uh, and, an, and additional sets of response files. So those would could would be considered the short Doyle data that is being sent out to county submitters. Are there gaps in those response files? That's what I think where we're kind of hanging up a little bit is what data gap means. And if you don't know offhand, you might need to collect a little bit more from uh, uh, within your organization about those gaps. Thank you. Uh, Glenn said, made a comment about data quality checks every other month. <laughs> um, I won't touch that one. <laughs> what what should be submitted, the resubmitted what should be the resubmitted 274 file having? Okay, wait. From this, this is from Kenna. What should be resubmitted in the 274 file with related to the date part of the file name? Is it the current date or the original submission date? And that question is for Sarah. Um, hold on one second. So it it should be according to the companion guide, the date that you submitted. Um, and please follow the companion guide instructions. Um, the, if you put the original date, it, it, the, the, the transaction will still process, but um, the instructions are to put the date that you actually submit that file, the submission date. Let me put some helpful links in the chat for everyone. Um, are there any other questions? It looks like we're coming up on 11 o'clock. We've ended a little bit early with the main part of this webinar series topic. Um, and I can give you a bit more time back to your day if, if there are no further questions. So we'll wait a, a few more seconds. And then if you have your questions, go ahead and send them um, to us at those shared group mailboxes. Thank you so much, everyone. This concludes our current topic on behavioral health. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next month when we talk about data templates, if that is um, of concern to you or a topic that you would enjoy listening to. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.